Good morning. Good morning. And welcome back. I, you already know how good it is to see, to see you and to see each other. It is good to be together again. The last time we were together in this sanctuary was the 15th of March. So it's been almost exactly four months. Who of us would have imagined or predicted we'd be away that long? But here we are, here we are again. Everyone this morning should be in the pink. <laughs> I, I trust that you are. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to say a word to you about, you know, uh, we've not been here to worship for, for uh, four months, but that doesn't mean the church has been closed. The church has not been closed. We've been hard at it and busy um, uh, the whole time. And uh, uh, trying to stay in touch with you in, in a variety of ways and, and uh, keep the congregation informed of what we're doing and what's going on. Um, a lot of the, the uh, thanks for that goes to the staff, to, to Shelly, who's been uh, keeping us online and in touch in that way, and to uh, uh, Chuck, who's been managing things here in the, in the building while uh, we've all been away, and to Justine, who has been also managing the office. I want you to know that um, even though we're here today, who knows where we'll be next week? Um, we will be assessing week by week whether we should continue to gather uh, and worship. And if we need to suspend the service again, we'll let you know um, through, uh, through email and through the, uh, the website and through Facebook and the ways that we've been communicating. We will let you know. But um, because of the, the way the coronavirus is moving through our country, um, we, don't, we don't know where we're going to be from week to week. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to to uh, uh, continue to worship here uh, on Sunday mornings as we are this morning. But if not, we will just have to roll with the punches <laughs> and we'll keep you informed as, as best we can. This morning, there are a few things that we do different in the worship service in order to make it um, safer for all of us. Um, first of all, you'll notice we all came in the same door. We're sitting a good distance apart. Uh, in the pews by using the, uh, the colored the colored codes there, um, we will we will be remaining seated for the entirety of the service. There won't be any parts of the service that we will stand for. Um, uh, the offering plates were on the on the seats as you came in the door, or you can uh, leave an offering there on your way out. We're only using the main doors today and in the in the near future, but the offering plates are there, so we don't have to pass them back and forth along the pews. Make your offering as you come in or as you, as you depart. Um, I, I, I'm going to tell you because I'm the one who needs to hear it the most. Um, I, see, I see everyone has masks on. We have masks for folks who don't have one or who forget theirs. Um, uh, and it's important that we keep uh, at least six feet between us. I'm the one who needs to hear that louder than anyone because I'm the one who's, uh, uh, who tends to, uh, to approach and get a little too close. So I'll help you remember if you help me remember. Um, it is good to be together to worship today. Are there any other concerns or announcements that you're aware of that we ought to make today? Yes. I'm wondering what we've heard about our Brazilian kids. What we've heard about? The kids from Brazil. The kids from Brazil. Shelly, do you have any word from the kids in They're Brazil? All safe. They're all safe. They're all safe. Thank you. They've been doing well. We've, we've enjoyed seeing them on some of the videos on Sunday mornings. Uh, there, yes, ma'am. I want to thank you for all the time and all Yes. Well, thank thank you. Um, you know, one of the hardest things for me as a pastor has been my inability to visit folks. Um, a number of folks from Grace Church have been hospitalized over the past few months, and I've, I've not been able to go see them. I've, I'm limited in who I can go see in nursing homes. I did have the chance to visit Wilma Fisher the other day, so that was, uh, that was very nice for me and for her. Um, but, uh, but staying in touch by phone and calling folks and just checking in is, is about all I've been able to do. And uh, I have to write a book for you sometime about some of the conversation experiences we've had over the phone. <laughs> Thank you. Any others? Thank you. Let's uh, um, turn our 
our thoughts and our sights inward now. Music of the prelude gives us an opportunity to prepare ourselves spiritually for the worship that lies just ahead of us. Merciful God, we meet to celebrate your greatness. We join with the hosts of heaven to sing your praise and to offer you worship. For you are worthy of adoration from every mouth, and every tongue should praise you. You created the earth by your power, you saved the human race by your mercy, and make it new by your grace. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we offer you our grateful praise.
difficult not to sing in church, isn't it? <laughs> but we know that that's one of the things we do that is most dangerous at this time. So appreciate the, the meditations that Shelley offers us in lieu of singing the hymns. Shall we pray together? Gracious God, we recognize your great gifts to us, our lives, this world, and your word to us. When we receive your word, help us to nurture it so that it grows, grows roots within us. Show us how to avoid being distracted by the lure of wealth or the cares of the world. Let us be good soil, receiving your word, understanding it, and acting upon it. Amen. Now, in a moment of silence, let us offer our personal confessions to God silently. We claim what the Apostle Paul teaches. The Spirit of God dwells in you. You are forgiven and free. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. One of the things that never ceases to surprise me about the scripture is that the Bible begins and ends with the hardest and the easiest books. But then folks are surprised when I say that the easiest book is the Revelation. The hardest book is Genesis. And in these days, in these weeks, um, our uh, Old Testament reading is from Genesis. And in that, in that book is one of the longest cycles of stories that exists in the Bible. We call it the, uh, the Jacob cycle. Um, it begins with Abraham and moves through his son, Isaac, and his son, Jacob, and Jacob's sons. And by the time we're finished, we're from the beginning, we have just Abraham, and in the end, we have a whole nation. Um, and the Genesis, that, that Jacob cycle in Genesis is written to help us understand the shape of the world. Just like the, the creation stories in the first part of Genesis are, re, are written so we can understand the shape of the world physically. The Jacob cycle is written so we might understand the shape of the world nationally and internationally. So today we turn to Genesis 25. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red. All his body was like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of the red stuff, some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus, 
Esau despised his birthright. Here ends the reading of the first lesson. Um, now, uh, Jim Flesher has an announcement or a couple of announcements for you that are important that uh, we make at this time. We would have made them earlier, but we weren't here. <laughs> Jim, thank you, sir. Thank you. Might be able to hear me better if I take that off. Uh, actually, you're listening to me today because I'm standing in proxy for Rick Albright. Rick couldn't be with us this morning because guess what? He's on vacation. He and his family are spending the week in Seattle City, New Jersey, and won't be here. And Rick had called me on Monday and asked if I could fill in for him, and I said I would. But somewhere the message got garbled. Either I didn't hear it correctly or he didn't give me the right information, but I have a big long speech prepared to tell you that the district superintendent had been appointed for another year to the Harrisburg district of the Central Pennsylvania Conference. Lo and behold, what I have to announce to you is that our pastor, Mike, has been reappointed to our congregation for one more year. And this gives me a lot more I agree, I, uh, uh, and it made my, my presentation much easier. <laughs> and while we're on the subject, I wanted to just uh, follow up on um, Pastor Mike's comments earlier on the amount of work that has been done by all of you uh, to see that the church continues to operate and has operated for the past 16 weeks, even though we weren't able to be here. Um, and. Uh, we see Jackson sitting over, sitting over here. Jackson, we very much appreciated you lighting the candle for us one day on the video. That was really nice. With Grandpa's help, I might add. Some, some instruction from Grandpa. But. And uh, we can't forget Shelly. Uh, I don't have words to express adequately the work that this lady has done for us. We always knew we had an outstanding and talented organist and music director. But what we didn't know is we also had an outstanding producer of videos. And she has done a yeoman's job over these last 16 or so weeks to keep us informed and, and provide um, very good services with a lot of thought going into them. And earlier, <laughs> earlier um, we had a question on the Brazilian students, and I was going to lift them up especially. But I just wanted to mention, in addition to what I said, is they're having a terrible time right now in Brazil with the coronavirus, and we need to keep those folks in our prayers because they are uh, having the same kinds of troubles we're having in certain areas of, of the United States. So, so thank That's you. Good. Thanks very much. Very much. Um, well, it was supposed to be one year, and now it's going to be who will see if you can survive. There have only been a few churches in the world who have survived Mike Minix for more than one year. <laughs> so you, <laughs> Jackson, could you come up for a minute? Do you want to come up and see Granddaddy? Oh, I got something to show you. Well, maybe not, that's okay. Jackson, you want to watch me from right there? <laughs> That's why he's looking back. Jackson, look here. Look here. I wanted to show you something. I, I planted some seeds in these flower pots. You've seen Grandma's garden. I planted some seeds in these flower pots and I watered them. And this one came up beautifully. But nothing grew in this pot even after I planted seeds in both pots and watered them. How come? Did I do something wrong? Maybe. But you know how it goes sometimes. Sometimes when you plant seeds, sometimes they come up and sometimes they don't. And sometimes the work that you do is productive and sometimes it's not. Well, this morning's gospel lesson is instructive in this regard. And so, I'll save the punchline for just a couple minutes from now. <laughs> okay, buddy? 
You recognize these plants? <laughs> Turn with me to the gospel now. Um, you'll, you'll find that, well, I'm sure you've seen the lessons are printed in your, in your bulletin. Matthew 13. The same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what is sown in the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arise on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Whenever I read this text, my, my memory takes me back to a time, because here is the place where the crowds were so great that Jesus stepped into a boat and put out a short distance so he could speak to the crowd. Um, some years ago, I was invited uh, to meet one of the congregations in this conference up at Laurel Lake. And uh, they were having a Galilean service. And the people all gathered on the shore. And they put me in a boat and put me out a short way from the shore so I could speak to the crowd, which I did. But when I got there and got settled in the boat and looked up to start to speak, I realized that that boat was leaking like a sin. <laughs> they had assured themselves a brief message that night. <laughs> and I've not forgotten that story. There's, a, uh, there's a, an old story about a farmer, uh, an experienced and tenured farmer, who was being visited by a young agricultural agent, a young government agent, fresh out of college. And this young man was working to enlighten the veteran farmer on the latest, most efficient farming methods that he could put into practice. After listening politely for several minutes, the farmer interrupted the young agent and said, Thanks for the information, son. But I already know how to farm 75% better than I do. I already know how to farm 75% better than I do. The story that Jesus tells about a farmer who similarly only achieved about 25% efficiency, the farmer was called a sower. That's what they called them in those days, a sower. He was planting his crop, according to Jesus' story, and the seeds leaving his hand fell in four directions. Some of the seed was carried by the wind and, and fell in places that were not even plowed. Easily seen by birds, it was eaten up rapidly. Some of the seed fell on stony ground. There the seed would lie, perhaps even germinate, but the sun would cause it to wilt and die. Third, some seed fell among the thorns. 
And even when it took root and began to grow, it could not survive the competition from the larger, more established thorny plants, so it also died. And Jesus says the fourth group of seeds, just 25% perhaps, fell on good ground and took root and grew and flourished and eventually was harvested. In spite of the wind and, and the rocks and the thistles, some seed did make it to the harvest. And that small amount of the seed, 25% perhaps, was worth the farmer's while. Because that minority of seed, that 25%, produced 30, 60, even 100-fold at the harvest. Then Jesus said, the fourth group of seeds, which was eventually harvested, was not a particularly good percentage, was it? How often would you or I invest ourselves in an enterprise where we knew that we were only going to achieve 25% success? Three quarters of the farmer's sowing was wasted. How happy would you be if you knew at the outset that three-quarters of your work, three-quarters of your investment, would be wasted? And yet, Jesus implies that 25% is fine. 25% is good enough. 25% will do it. He is talking, of course, about the kingdom of God and saying that when it comes to people responding to the word, to the seed and growing into discipleship, 25% is fine. 25% is not such a bad return. When some folks hear the word about the kingdom of God, Jesus suggests, they are often distracted by other things that seem important. And so the good news of God and the good news of Jesus doesn't take root in them. It withers and dies. According to Jesus, the things, the things that most threaten in this way are wealth and comfort. Those are distractions that keep us from hearing God's word. And those, those are two things that, that most threaten us because we have them, wealth and comfort in such abundance. Sometimes we are so focused on ourselves that we can't adopt someone else's perspective, even if that someone else is God, who wants to show us God's values and God's goals and God's mission and God's kingdom. We can't comprehend them because the values and the goals and the, goals and the mission that we have in building our own kingdoms are so productive. Bruce Larson told a story years ago about a, a young African woman who came to stay in the United States from Angola. Her name was Maria, and Maria was known for being the one who was always laughing. One day she went to a meeting in her church on evangelism where they were talking about pamphlets and missions and campaigns and all the rest. At one point, someone in the meeting turned to Maria and said, what do they do in your church in Angola, Maria? In my church, she said, after a moment's thought, we don't give pamphlets to people or have missions. We just send one or two Christian families to live in a village, and when people see what Christians are like, they want to be Christians themselves. Maybe, maybe those are the, the best kinds of seeds to sow. But even when we do, even when we do what the church does in the best ways that we know how, and we are diligent and energetic about pursuing, even then, Jesus suggests, even then, only some of the seed will fall on fertile ground, and, and our productiveness would be only about 25%. On the other hand, any pastor would be delighted if 25% of her congregation or his congregation really caught the message of the kingdom of God and, and acted upon it. What parent would not be happy if one-fourth of what you said to a child really took root in that kid. Any teacher would feel successful if a quarter of what is taught really takes hold. 
and a social worker or anyone engaged in services to others, the poor, the disenfranchised, the needy, would settle for a 25% return on their benevolent or philanthropic investment. It's, it's not that 25% should be our goal. Jesus is not suggesting that that's what we should aim for or be satisfied with. He's telling us that that's simply the way life is. And, and that's, my, that's my point with my pepper plants here, the one that grew and the one that didn't. Well, well the one that didn't, I, you know, I might have done something wrong. I might not have. But that's the way life is. Sometimes the seeds grow and sometimes they don't. That's why you plant so many. Even so, when, uh, if we counted the peppers we get off this plant here, the one that grew, and totaled up the number of seeds, and planted those seeds next year, there would be thousands, thousands of plants. So that's the kind of harvest Jesus talks about comes from the pepper plant that grows, produces such an abundance of seeds that the ones that don't grow end up not mattering. 25% should not be our goal, but that's the way, that's the way life is. That's just the way it is. Even, even Jesus talked to people and ministered to people and healed to people who didn't respond to him or respond well to him. Everyone who experienced Jesus' presence and his teaching and his miracles didn't embrace him or the kingdom that he taught. There were some, remember, who endeavored to do him in, and eventually they succeeded in executing him. It's not that 25% should be our goal, but that's the way life is. Don't be discouraged. Don't lose heart. 25% is fine, because even then, the harvest that God provides is 30, 60, even 100 fold. So don't count on a big return from your Christian, humanitarian, or benevolent investment. 100% would be incredible. 75% would be excellent. 50% would be great. But chances are, we won't get close to those. We'll be satisfied with 25% results, as Jesus suggests that 25% is fine. If Jesus were telling his story to us today in our non-agrarian world that we live in, I wonder if he might tell the story of, of Frank Woolworth. Perhaps you've heard about him and his experience. Frank Woolworth opened the second five and ten cent store in the world in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He opened the first store in Utica, New York, but that business um, was so bad that he was in danger of bankruptcy. So with his last $30, Frank Woolworth set out for a new location, and he arrived in Lancaster. Late one afternoon, he was amazed to see the sidewalks and stores jammed with people. After buying supper in a restaurant, he spent most of the evening walking around the business, business section of Lancaster. He spent the night in the hotel. The next morning, he found a vacant building to rent. So in early June, 1879, Frank Woolworth closed his Utica store. It had failed, and 10 days later, he was open for business in Lancaster. Woolworth's concept was unique in those days. He sold on volume. He only sold the things in his store for 10 cents or less. He opened the store with $410 worth of stock, and he sold a third of it the first day. The best sellers were tinware and wash basins, ribbons and washcloths, toys and handkerchiefs. Keep expenses low, he wrapped the purchases in old newspapers, and he was the only clerk. After such a good beginning in Lancaster, Woolworth considered expanding. He opened another store in guess where? Harrisburg. And then a third one in York. But those two stores failed. Only one time out of four was Frank Woolworth successful. 25%. The stores in Utica and Harrisburg and York failed, but the one in Lancaster succeeded. And that was enough for him. 25% was fine. He kept going. He opened another store in Scranton, and that was a success from the beginning. F.W. Woolworth became one of the most successful 
men of his time because he was not frustrated with a three-quarter failure rate. He accepted what he had and he kept going. He did not get discouraged. I wonder if Jesus might tell the story that way if he were telling it to us today. There's, there's an apocryphal story about the, uh, the Wright brothers. Uh, on the day they were pushing their airplane up the hill in Kitty Hawk, no one had ever flown an airplane before. And a man watching from the sideline said, you'll never get that thing off the ground. It was December 17th, 1903. But Orville and Wilbur just kept pushing that plane until they got it up the side of Big Kill Devil Hill. The skeptic kept saying, it won't take off, boys. You're wasting your time. But they pushed it off the edge of the hill. And when it began to fly, that vocal opponent on the sidelines said, well, if you do it like that, of course it'll fly. Keep pushing. Keep sowing. Keep living the gospel and its values. Jesus encourages us through the parable. There will be failures. There will also be a measure of success. And you can just hear the naysayers, the scribes, the Pharisees saying, it won't work. Too many rocks, too many thistles, too many birds to gobble up the seed. Not enough money, not enough people, not sufficient interest to keep the church of Jesus Christ going. The church that needs to feed the hungry and welcome the stranger and comforts those who are brokenhearted. But then, despite the, despite the angst of the naysayers and the discouragement that we see all the time, some of our seed takes root. Some of what we say and do makes a difference and flourishes and makes it to the harvest. Well, if you do it like that, sure it'll grow. Sure it will. If the gospel is to be spread, if children are to be taught, if minds are to be educated, if the hungry are to be fed, if the poor are to be elevated to planes of hope, we must continue to be diligent and generous and faithful, even though discouraging experience may prove that three-fourths of our effort is not productive at all. Even so, Jesus promises the harvest that God provides is 30, 60, even a hundredfold. Don't be discouraged. Keep pushing. Keep sowing. Keep giving. Keep loving. Amen. Would you pray with me now? How grateful we are, God, that, uh, that you move in our lives and in our world. And that we are able to recognize your movement and to see you at work. Certainly we are living in a time when there's, when there's a great deal of discouragement and, and a great deal to be discouraged about. We are in the midst of a world pandemic. More than 130,000 people in our country alone have died. And many millions have been infected by a debilitating illness. And we don't yet fully understand how it moves and how it works. We are most certainly in the midst of a challenging and difficult time. Not only for that reason, but for many others as well. We've been placed in a circumstance where we can recognize more easily some of the inequities in life that, that folks experience, and some of the, the, the difficulties and the, uh, and the trials that they face, uh, uh, the unfairness of life, the way we've structured it. We are living in the midst of, of a difficult time, and yet we are confident that you are walking with us. You are, you are working to show us your way and your values and to strengthen us to live. And there are actually sometimes, God, when we hear you, we hear your voice and we understand your word. And we're able to be 
kind when others have not been kind to us, and generous when we are needy ourselves, and gracious when we have suffered. Continue to work with us, God. Be patient with us. Continue to show us your way to teach us, to encourage us. For we are your people, the ones who recognize who you are and hunger to be directed by your voice and your word. There are many of our congregation who have, have been ill and hospitalized, undergone surgery and uh, faced uh, repeated treatments over the past weeks, folks who we've not been able to care for in the ways that we typically do, but we pray for all of them, members of their families, neighbors, co-workers, all of those whom we hear are ill and in need. So for those who are undergoing treatments and recovering from surgery, dealing with physical ailments, hear our prayers that their healing might be quick and complete, and that through all of that they may, they may draw themselves closer to you. Hear our prayers as we have expressed our gratitude this morning for those who, who have been at work at Grace Church keeping things going while the congregation has been absent. Hear our prayers for all of those who we now know as essential workers, those who care for us when we're ill, those, those who uh, help to provide the things that we need in, in stores and in our, in our neighborhood for police and fire personnel and grocery workers and nurses and doctors, all of those who continue to work despite the danger to themselves. Hear our prayers of thanks. Show us, show yourself to us ever more convincingly, O oh God. Call us to the work that you would have us to do. Equip us with the strength and the conviction that we need to, to live your values, your kingdom values, day by day. For we offer ourselves to you along with our prayers in the name and in the spirit of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
God's richest blessings are ours already. God has held nothing back from us. Even God's own child, God did not hold back from us, but gave, to, gave him to us freely for us to do with him as we chose. God has held nothing back from us. God's richest blessings are ours already. All that remains is for us to receive them, accept them, and to do the things that God calls us to do, to be the people God calls us to be. Achieving the values and goals of that kingdom which God has set in motion among us. Go in the peace 